Okay, here we are. It is February 10th, 2022. I can't believe it. And uh, Steve is not with us. Steve, you there? Okay. All right. So uh, tonight we're starting our special series on the Antichrist. You know, it's that topic is always so difficult to teach because there's such a large swath of information to go through. I was just looking at our South Beach Gospel Ministries YouTube page and I noticed, Steve, the last time we did it was October of 2019. So it's been a two and a half years. I can't believe it. I can't believe we've, we've gone two and a half years since we've done the Antichrist. So we're gonna be looking at that tonight and probably for the next couple of sessions at the very least. Um, so what I thought I would do to, to make it helpful is to list create a little chart that has a summary of the critical passages in scripture related to the antichrist and there are many so i tried to pick out the best and the brightest so that we can just do an overview tonight as to what the bible says about this entity the antichrist and as we see all the stuff that's going on certainly the world we live in now right genevieve is different than than the one in 2019 in october 10th of 2019 the last time we started a series on the Antichrist, we didn't have a worldwide pandemic. We didn't have all kinds of things that have happened that we only could have read about in an Orwellian sort of uh, dystopic nightmare science fiction novel. But a lot of those things have come to pass right before our very eyes since the last time we broached this topic. And of course, last time we did, I was hoping that that would be the last time before the rapture, but hey, uh, we, we press on, you know. Um, so I made a little chart similar to the one that we looked at last week on the return of the Nephilim, and I'm going to hold it up to the screen. This is very low tech, but so that those of you guys that are at home can make your own little uh, screenshot PDF that has the verses there. So I'm going to move it in for you a little bit. And there you go. So hopefully that'll give you guys that are following along at home a chance to take a look at that and make your own little PDF of the passages. And if I turn it sideways, I think that'll help out. There in the screen is all the verses that you're gonna need to follow through on our teaching about the Antichrist for the next couple of sessions right there. So let me throw it back up. And Genevieve, why don't you open up a quick word of prayer and then we'll jump right in. Okay. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for the opportunity to gather today here and those that are listening out there on the internet. And um, thank you for bringing this this um, lesson today, which we more need than ever before. And uh, a blessed Pastor Herb so that he can put it out and may the Spirit be with them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray. Amen. All right, so last week we finished up our series on the return of the Nephilim, and I thought it was a good segue to go from that into this to the extent that one of the key and critical points that's being made about the entity known as the Antichrist, is that he will be a real, live person. Now, in some liberal branches of Christianity, maybe if you spoke to somebody from the Lutheran Church or the Presbyterian Church or whatever, uh, you know, maybe even the Catholic Church, they would suggest that the Antichrist is a type or a shadow or a picture. Metaphorically speaking, St. Augustine would tell us, a metaphor for evil or a metaphor for opposition to God. But the Bible speaks a different truth. One that when we look at, you know, prophetic books, particularly the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, which are directly in play here with the topic related to the Antichrist especially, we find out that the mistakes that individuals, and I remember Chuck Missler saying this in one of his, uh, you know, Bible prophecy teachings, is that the mistake he had made over the years when looking at passages from prophetic books like Revelation and Daniel was not looking at it literally enough, but trying to symbologize or metaphorize stuff that we saw in there, like Revelation chapter 9, we kind of talked about, that was so horrific to the, to the reading that we would say, this can't be literally true. There can't be transgenic monsters flying through the air like 
Godzilla and Ghidra on you know some Japanese science fiction movie shooting fire out of their their mouths and killing people but we find out when we look at scripture that the scriptures that we read really are telling us the literal truth when Revelation uses a metaphor like Jesus says I am the door we know that's a metaphor for Jesus being the way to eternal life and that he's not suggesting that he's literally uh, you know a six and a half foot by three and a half foot rectangular piece of wood with a metal handle in the middle of his belly button he's saying that he's the door as a metaphor but we can interpret that and we can divine that from the context of the scripture but when we look at what uh was last week's teaching the return of the nephilim i, I said that one of the key passages there was daniel chapter 2 verse 43 when it makes reference using the personal pronoun they they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And I made the point that, you know, Chuck Minster, I think, was one of the first persons that bring that out, brought that out directly, that if the personal pronoun they is making reference to something other than the seed of men, then they must be something other than human beings. And that is one of the key passages in Scripture that gives us the literal interpretation of the Nephilim, which we found was uh, the key and critical interpretation of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And it just says, the sons of God, the B'nai Ha'elohim in Hebrew, let's go through that real quickly, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, which we now know, because you, you attended our Bible study last week, we now know that the sons of God are angels, and they came in unto the daughters of men, meaning human females, and the same bare children to them, and the same became the mighty men, the Hagibarim, which were of old, men of renown. And so that was one of the key and critical passages we looked at last week. Now, when we go to our study on the Antichrist, I listed out some basic general terms that I wanted to familiarize you guys with. We know that Antichrist is really the anglicized version of a greek term antichristos antichristos can be interpreted two ways and remember i talked throughout my years of teaching all of you guys that the bible oft times by way of the holy spirit contains what i would call a double entendre meaning that they can have two different meanings in the same passage and both can be literally true you know, uh, we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which talks about the Antichrist and tells us when the Antichrist is going to be revealed. So if you go on any Bible prophecy website right now, I've gone on a few and they said, uh, Emmanuel Macron is the Antichrist, you know, the president of France. And he certainly could, could fit the bill, right? He's a pretty obvious choice. But since everybody thinks He's the Antichrist. Now, remember, eight years ago, it was Barack Obama. Barack Obama was the Antichrist eight years ago. Now they've changed it and switched it to uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. It, it wasn't Barack Obama. So everybody that said that and everybody, almost everybody in Bible prophecy circles were saying that eight years ago. That turned out to be wrong. And now they're saying Emmanuel Macron is the Antichrist. That's going to have to turn out to be wrong, too. Or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 will be wrong. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that... The Antichrist can't be revealed until after the departure of the church. And that word there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a word that can be interpreted as a metaphorical or a symbolical uh, departure, but it can also be a literal departure. And so uh, we'll take a look at that again. So double entendres in scripture are very key and very important. But the double entendre as relates to the Antichrist, Antichristos, the Greek uh, word that is translated Antichrist in English, can mean against Christ. And that's what we normally think of. The devil is against God and the Antichrist is against Jesus. But it can also be interpreted literally true as well as standing in the place of. Anti can be the one who replaces Christ. So Antichrist can be the replacement Christ. That's why the Pope's title that he selected for himself is, is pretty, you know, kind of uh, creepy. And maybe, you know, it's a way that the Holy Spirit, Steve, is over there laughing over there in Alabama, uh, joining us by way of Zoom. So always glad to have you guys 
uh, out there in YouTube land, Facebook land, and on Zoom land. Hello to all you guys and to uh, Jonathan Cruz, uh, is our newest subscriber. What's up, Jonathan? Glad that you uh, are a subscriber to South Beach Gospel Ministries. And those of you that haven't yet, go on YouTube and select South Beach Gospel Ministries and click on the like and subscribe button. Make comments because that pushes our videos up higher in the Google envelope rhythm. And so anyway, um, the double entendre antichrist can be in opposition to Christ, but it can also be the replacement Christ. Antichrist can be interpreted as the one who stands in the place of Christ. The name, the formal title of the head of the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope, is Vicarius Christi in Latin, which means literally the one who stands in place of Christ. In English, Genevieve, who was in the Catholic Church, would tell us that it is contracted out in the English form to the Vicar of Christ. And everybody is familiar with that term, V-I-C-A-R. The Vicar of Christ means Vicarius Christi in Latin. It means the one who stands in the place of Christ. But in Greek, that translation would be, you know, Antichristos. Vicarius Christi in Latin is the same thing as Antichristos in Greek and means the one who stands in the place of Christ. In fact, the Pope claims that he is the representative of God on earth. He stands in the place of Christ on earth now that Jesus has gone away, and, and he wouldn't even deny that. He would say, that's, that's my position. My place is to stand in place of Christ because he's gone now. That's why he picked the title of Vicarius Christi. Monte Cristo, in place of Christ, it's probably even a more representative description of this entity that's coming who isn't going to be just uh, an era of bad times on the planet Earth, but it's going to be a literal person. We look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Genevieve, if you want to flip there, uh, Steve, if you could flip there too, it's pretty short and simple. Whichever one of you guys get there first can read it and... Uh, Hopefully, that mic that you're speaking through, Steve, on Genevieve's phone will, will carry us. So, Genevieve, do you have that? Yes, sir. Read uh, for us First uh, John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and, ye, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Okay, so what we find out then is John is saying in his first of three letters he wrote to the church. He wrote the book of Revelation when he was in prison on the island of Patmos, and then once the Lord had him released so that he could be the last of the apostles to speak to the church that had been built up while he was in prison, all the other apostles, by the way, were dead by this point. By the time John, who was the right-hand man of Jesus and who was the writer of the Gospel of John, which is the most unique of the four Gospels, the only non-synoptic Gospel is the Gospel of John, which really emphasized the deity of Christ. John, after doing that, gets imprisoned on the island of Patmos for preaching the Gospel, and instead of dying, after you know many years of hard labor, God allowed you know, Caesar to have him released so he could write three letters to the church. First John, second John, third John. First John, he writes, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. And so it's John who coins the term that has become probably the most famous or infamous, if you will, title for this particular individual that we know in scripture will be a replacement for Jesus Christ during the unique time on earth known as the 70th week of Daniel, which we've looked at at length and which ties into this. So uh, John, again, he's saying that uh, little children, we know it is the last hour. So 2,000 years ago when John penned Revelation 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, it was already the last day. So now, Steve, it's the last hour minutes, seconds, nanoseconds of the last hour. If it was the last hour 2,000 years ago, how much later is it now? And remember, too, we have looked in times past, again, at the prophetic entendres, if you will. Remember, Jesus said, after two days, you know, I will be glorified and dwell in their sight. 
And so we remember that scripture says that God sees a day as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. That passage could very well be saying that Jesus was predicting that the church era of grace, where you could be saved by faith through grace alone for 2,000 years or two God days. After that, the church era will end with an event called the rapture. And it is that that point that the Antichrist can be revealed for the first time because of the restrainer, which is the Holy Spirit working through the body of Christ known as the church, will be removed from the earth. God is never removed from the earth, but the active working of the Holy Spirit by and through this new entity that was created on the day of Pentecost, some 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, um, called the church. That entity, which will be eventually the bride of Christ, which we thankfully are all part of, will be removed from the earth before that final seven year period of time that the Bible refers to as the 70th week of Daniel, which is the period of time when God's wrath will come down upon the earth and upon the kingdom of the Antichrist, which will be established at this time. So. John in 1 John 2.18 tells us that this individual called the Antichrist is coming. Distinguished from a lot of other Antichrists, a lot of people will come in the name of Christ, a lot of people will have the spirit of opposition to Christ or the spirit of counterfeiting Christ, which is to me an even bigger problem in the church right now. The David Koresh's and who else, Steve, uh, came as a type of Antichrist, who literally said they were Christ. Jim Al Jones. Who's that? Jim Jones. Jim Jones, that's right. In Guyana, South America, Jim Jones actually declared himself to be Jesus Christ reincarnated. David Koresh in Waco, Texas, did the same thing in 1993. Here in Miami, there was a guy out in Doral for many years who claimed to be Jesus Christ and uh, would make people take a 666 tattoo, which clearly kind of indicated that he was a false, artificial, counterfeit Christ. And so, again, we have seen many Christs come, but John is saying that there is a specific individual that is called with the definitive article, the, placed in front of it, the Antichrist. Now we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Steve, and that is a passage I'm going to let you read because that's kind of your bailiwick. That we were talking earlier, actually. And actually, the very first Bible study Steve ever attended was one I was doing over at Liz Potter's house over, uh, you know, uh, on, on Miami Beach at Mid Beach uh, when she was living in Mid Beach. And it was on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Steve said, man, that was the most memorable Bible study that I had ever attended. And that was the very first one where Steve and I got to know each other. So, yeah, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 is kind of your thing, Steve. So, okay. read it up and, and kick it out. I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the seemableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So I'm hoping they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So I'm hoping everybody out there in, in video land could hear Steve. Um, 
it was coming to us via Zoom from Alabama. So let's unpack that. Basically, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the Thessalonian church. He had already written a letter that said, hey guys, don't be panicked because the Gnostic pseudo-Christians that told you that you're already in the tribulation period, meaning you would have been left behind, the rapture hasn't happened yet. That day won't come. And he told us, you know, that day comes in a flash and a twinkling of an eye, the final moment at the trump of God, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. But then he followed up that letter with a second letter to the Thessalonian church, again, making reference and, and confirming to the Thessalonians that this mystical, you know, snatching away called the harpazo, um, which we translate into Latin as rapturo, which we translate into English as caught up. That hasn't happened yet. And Paul was telling the Thessalonian church that that can't happen yet. And the day of the Lord or the 70th week of Daniel can't happen until the Antichrist is revealed. And the Antichrist can't be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. So Steve just read to us. He says, don't be troubled by spirit of word. The Gnostic fake Christians, who were like the Jehovah's Witnesses of their day, were teaching false doctrine that everybody had been left behind and that there was no rapture and that they were in the tribulation period. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. That's verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For that day shall not come. What day? The day that the wrath of the Lord begins, uh, the 70th week of Daniel. That day can't start yet, except there come a falling away first. Now that word falling away in English is actually another double entendre word. In Greek, the word is apostasia. Apostasia can be translated as a falling away uh, rhetorically or philosophically, falling away from the truth of scripture. And it can also be translated as a capturing away or physical removal. So apostasia, which is translated falling away, can literally be translated in Greek into departure. So when we hear the word falling away, we should be thinking apostasia in Greek means departure. We have the word apostasy, which is a literal translation of that apostasia, meaning like once upon a time, Charles Taze Russell believed in the King James Bible and hell. But then later, he apostatized from cardinal, basic, fundamental, biblical Christian faith to create the Jehovah's Witnesses that got rid of hell and demoted Jesus from God the Son to the Archangel Michael. So once upon a time, Charles Taze Russell believed biblical doctrine that's contained in the King James Bible then he departed from that belief system and created a belief system of his own, which caused him to abandon the King James Bible and create a new Bible called the New World Translation so that he could teach there is no hell and that Jesus is just a created being known as the Archangel Michael. That's a departure from the faith or the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And so what Paul is saying is that before the day of the Lord begins and the Antichrist is revealed, there must be a departure. I would submit to you that that word is a double entendre, meaning they're two separate and different meanings, both of which are absolutely 100% true. A departure, just like Charles Taze Russell departed from biblical doctrine to create the Jehovah's Witnesses, we are seeing within what is called nominally the body of Christ or Christianity, a departure from basic elementary belief systems that control when Paul was on the earth, when John was on the earth, when the first century believers that are written about in the book of Acts are on the earth. Now we have gay marriages in the church, we have women pastors in the church, we have all kinds of new doctrines that all different types of belief systems can get you to heaven and you can still call yourself a Christian. You have the Jehovah's Witnesses who have the Archangel Michael as Jesus. You have other uh, forms of what is called Christianity. It says that there is no Trinity. There is no God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And then you have other groups like, say, Seventh-day Adventists, for, for uh, example, who, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, have done away 
with hell. Now, in the book of Acts, the believers held to the doctrine of hell because Jesus taught it, Paul taught it, and it was throughout the Bible. Now, we have all kinds of different aberrant belief systems that are under the rubric or the umbrella that calls itself Christianity. That is a literal fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the falling away, which has to come first. First before what? Before the, the, the revelation of the Antichrist during the day of the Lord. And so the second literal true meaning of the word apostasia, which can be translated departure, can mean not just a rhetorical, philosophical, or religious departure from biblical truth to, to apostate, heretical, pseudo-Christian belief, but also a physical departure. So a literal correct translation of that word, apostasia, can be a departure. Steve departed from Miami Beach to, Al what city are you in again, Steve? Dothan. Dothan. Steve departed Miami Beach for Dothan, Alabama. He did that literally and physically. But what Steve didn't depart from was the belief system that Jesus is God and human flesh and the gospel saves, which is what he believed when he was preaching the gospel with me on Miami Beach. He departed physically to Dothan, Alabama, and he's still believing the same thing and preaching it to the people of Dothan, Alabama now. So he didn't depart rhetorically or doctrinally. He did depart uh, physically. He departed physically from South Beach to Dothan, Alabama. That is an apostasia, a physical apostasia, but he didn't apostasia doctrinally because he still believes the Bible is the word of God. So we find out then that a falling away has to come first. Then it says, and that man of sin, there's a title for the Antichrist hidden in scripture, that man of sin be revealed. So it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Just in case we're wondering who it is, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Now, the only other person in all of Scripture that's referred to ever in, in Scripture as the son of perdition is who? Steve, do you know? Steve, who's the only other person in the Bible referred to as the son of perdition other than this individual? Uh, was it Ju Judas? Judas. Judas is the only other person referred to in Scripture as the son of perdition, which literally means the son of destruction or damnation, which may suggest, and Chuck Missler and some other Bible prophecy scholars have suggested that maybe Judas was of the line of the Nephilim, meaning that he wasn't fully Adamic, which means that even from before he started as Jesus' disciple, he was already damned to hell because he wasn't one of us. So just like people who take the mark of the beast and the book of Revelation, he isn't eligible for salvation anymore because he's not fully Adamic. But that's not my talking point for today. That's just an aside that I threw in at no additional cost. Actually, there's no charge, but, you know, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency in your mind, you, you, you know, you'd pay me an additional 100, you know, uh, Bitcoins or something for that additional bit of uh, biblical truth if we were a typical commercial Christian organization, which we are not. So, anyway, we find out then that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is this individual, we find out in verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, and here are the three key points, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, is God. And that is uh, also something that's referred to by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, and by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, which means that Scripture all ties itself together so that we don't have to have any doubt about who this son of perdition is. Son of perdition is the Antichrist that John wrote about in 1 John. He is the false Christ that is the abomination of desolation that Jesus wrote about or told us about and was written down in Matthew chapter 24. So let's go on. It says, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then you go on to verse 8, and it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. So we're not talking about Satan himself, but someone whose coming is after the working of Satan with, as Steve has already told us, all power and signs and lying wonders and more importantly with all the seepableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. See, those are the guys that get left behind after the rapture. They are going to be deceived because they were unrighteous and they're going to perish because of that unrighteousness. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved when you and I and Genevieve were on South Beach passing out chick tracks trying to get people saved. Some took them and got saved and some chose not to take them and to not get saved. Those that didn't take them and got left behind are going to be part of this deceivableness because they were unrighteous and they're going to perish. Why? Because they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. We find out Paul is telling us 2,000 years in advance. And it says they have rejected the love of the truth that they might be saved. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the love of the truth that would save them that they rejected. And then verse 11, the, the, you know, these two terrifying last two verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, and for this cause, God, God himself, shall send them, the people left behind after the rapture, when the Antichrist is revealed, that are left behind, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe in the New King James Version, it says, the lie, and that, that is the proper translation. They should believe not just a lie, but believe the lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God himself is going to send a delusion to the people left behind who have already rejected the gospel prior to the rapture. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth. And so God now, at this point in time, after the rapture of the church, after the apostasy and departure of the church from the earth, when the apostasy in the church gets bad enough where it's going to be against the law to be a Christian, not only from the secular humanists or occultic governments that run the world, but within what's called the church, when biblical fundamentalists like us are rejected by the vast majority of Christendom, then that will be the time when Jesus has to come for his bride. And the Father says, go get him, and he's going to snatch us out of the world. And then Antichrist can be revealed. And then God's going to send a strong delusion. And some people, Chuck Missler, I've mentioned many times in the past, Dave Hunt, uh, IDE Thomas, a, a former uh, Presbyterian Scottish pastor, all support the theory that the lie that God is going to send, deluding the people left behind that have rejected the gospel into believing, will relate to two things. The Antichrist is actually the Messiah and... The rapture was really UFOs, extraterrestrials, and unidentified flying objects zapping the people who were haters and who didn't love and who wouldn't accept others different from them. They were removed from the earth for one, either reconditioning on another planet so we can get our attitudes right and then they'll bring us back, or that we were zapped by benevolent alien extraterrestrials who come to the earth to help us by getting rid of all the bad guys, which was the fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians who wouldn't accept anybody else in any other worldview other than the Jesus is God worldview. That has been suggested by conservative scholars such as I.D.E. Thomas, Chuck Missler, Dave Hunt. All these guys have suggested that, and that's the position that I think is also the legitimate and true one. The lie, I think, ties in to something related to extraterrestrials and UFOs. Because if you think about it, that would be the only possible explanation to you know, explain away, Steve, the disappearance of how many people, how many people are truly born again? I was thinking about this the other night. How many people are actually really fundamentally born again believers who would disappear at the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, boom, they'd all be gone? Goodness forbid, uh, you know, uh, you got, what, about 8 billion people on Earth now? Maybe you would have uh, 800 million. I would say, you know, the, the, the floor would be about 300 million and the ceiling would be about 1 billion, meaning one out of every eight. 
but maybe it'll be less than that. Maybe it's between one out of every 15 people and one out of every, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 10 people. That would give you somewhere between 300 million and maybe eight or 900 million born again believers. But even if it's the lower number, 300 million people disappearing, you know, that's the entire population of the United States of America. If everybody in America disappeared, the rest of the world would freak out overnight. If it's three times that amount, you're going to have three times the freak out. But even if you had half that amount, the whole world would be thrown into chaos overnight. If 300 million to a billion people disappeared instantaneously from every spot on the earth all at the same time with no trace left behind, there would have to be, Genevieve, a meta physical explanation. They couldn't just say, well, it was an earthquake they fell into, you know, uh, you know, a, a gorge open up. What's that? In sinkholes where your house falls, or your car, you wake up in the morning, your car's gone. It fell into a sinkhole and then the earth closed up after it. Okay, maybe you could, you could explain that for a car disappearing, but you couldn't explain that for uh, 300 million to a billion people all around the world, every different uh, ethnic background, every different language, every different continent on the earth, every different land mass called the country on the earth. You wouldn't be able to explain that except you were to either supernaturalize it and people say, oh my gosh, it's that, what do you call it? The rapture thing that all those evangelical Christians were talking about all those years about people disappearing to go on the cloud for you with Jesus. Now, Satan is not going to want that to be belief. Why? Because people are going to run to the nearest chapel, the nearest church, or fall to their knees on the ground and pray to receive Jesus immediately. Oh, Lord, save me, save me. It, you know, the rapture happened, I got left behind, which means the Antichrist must be coming. You would be terrified. But Satan, who has been waiting to reveal his man, the Antichrist, has been restrained. And I will submit to you, he's been restrained by the active power and participation of the Holy Spirit by and through the body known as the church. Once the church is moved out of the way, the restraint on Satan revealing his man, the Antichrist, is gone. And so that's what that phrase that Steve just read in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In the old King James, letteth really literally means restraints. So you would translate that version, uh, that, that, that verse into modern language. He who is restraining will continue to restrain until this restrainer is taken out of the way. And I would submit to you the restrainer is God the Holy Spirit that lives in the body of the church while we're on the earth. And when we're not on the earth, then the Holy Spirit's act of participation in the church is no longer on the earth. Now the Antichrist can be revealed. Now all hell on earth is going to break loose. Now the judgments of God have to come down out of heaven. Why? Because Antichrist does what? He commits the abomination of desolation. What is this abomination of desolation? It is a repeat of what Antiochus Epiphanes did prior to the birth of Christ when he went into the rebuilt temple, took a pig and slaughtered it and spilled pig blood all over the altar of God in the rebuilt temple um, during the reign of the Grecian Empire of the Seleucids. The Seleucid Empire was the empire established by General Seleucus who took one quarter of Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire when he died suddenly at the age of 32, I think it was, and he split up the Grecian Empire amongst his four generals. General Seleucus took the part that included Judea and Syria, and eventually one of his grandsons, who called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, also called Epimenes the madman, he hated the Jews and he hated the religion of the Jews and he took a pig into the rebuilt temple and slaughtered it to ritually desecrate it so they couldn't do worship services there. And that's why, remember we did the study back in December on Hanukkah, the festival of light, when God supernaturally caused one day's worth of holy oil to last for eight days so the temple could be ritualistically re-cleansed. And Jesus, who celebrated Hanukkah and talked about Hanukkah, also talks about this desecration. He makes a double entendre uh, reference to the abomination of desolation, uh, spoken of by the prophet Daniel.
But the prophet Daniel isn't speaking about Antiochus Epiphanes' abomination. The prophet Daniel was looking down the corridors of time and seeing a different abomination of desolation, which was similar to and which was typed or foreshadowed by the desecration of Antiochus Epiphanes. And that would be the Antichrist himself, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, going into the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's even worse in God's eyes than a pagan Grecian emperor spilling pig blood on the uh, floor of the altar. Um, so we move on and let's take a look. One of the other passages we're going to look at, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Oh, we had talked about the Nephilim, right? Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we saw that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare them children. The same became the mighty men of the Gibberim of old, men of renown, the men of legends, which I cite there in my teaching on the Antichrist only to support the proposition that Fallen angels did, in fact, at one point in time in human history, come down to earth in physical forms like supermen, and they were able to have sexual relations with human females and somehow impart their genetic or creative uh, material into the womb of the woman and create a pregnancy that resulted in a hybridized demigod man, according to the Greek mythology, who were basically supermen. That's why they were called Giborim, the mighty ones. Also, they were referred to as the Nephilim, the fallen ones, because their fathers were angels that had fallen down out of heaven and abandoned their first estate. They were also called Anakim, which meant the chained ones, and the Rephaim, which meant the dead ones, because we found out that they weren't eligible for resurrection, that is to say, they weren't eligible for eternal life. Why? Because they weren't truly Adamic men. And since Jesus became a man to die for the sins of men, he didn't become a Nephilim to die for the sins of the Nephilim. So they, the Nephilim, don't have a substitutionary sacrifice, a kinsman redeemer, or a blood sacrifice that can get them into the kingdom of heaven. But that's an aside, that's not today's talk. The point of me uh, making reference to Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is simply for the fact of pointing out the unusual and highly controversial concept that an angelic being can create a biogenetic hominid looking man, a superman, a demigod, a part angel, part human hybrid that is not eligible for salvation because the Lord never intended that creature to be. And I would submit that there's support of that three chapters earlier in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Steve, jump there and read that for me real quickly. And we will unpack that in our general overview on Antichrist. And uh, we'll look at these verses in more detail next week. But Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is what we looked at last week, or actually two weeks ago, we called it the Proto-Evangelion, the very first gospel that talked about the virgin-born God-man who would die for the sins of the world to save uh, the human race. But it also says something else very important to tonight's teaching on the Antichrist. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Steve? Okay. And I will put between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bring So what, what are we talking about? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What we have then, it is God has come down into the Garden of Eden after the fall. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6 gives us the terrible recitation of Satan coming as a form of a serpent to deceive and to seduce Eve into partaking of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, occultic knowledge to make her the first goddess in the history of the universe. And when she saw that the fruit would be good to her and beautiful to the eyes and desirable to make one wise so that she could become a goddess, she took and ate of it and gave to her husband also who was with her so that they fell from grace. And as a result of that, God comes down into the garden in the cool of the day and he doesn't call out for Eve, remember, because Adam was the guy in charge. Remember, the captain of the Titanic is the one that the ship owner is going to call, hey, my ship sank. 
uh, put the captain on. Well, I was sleeping. It was the first mate, Steve. Talk to him. Like, no, I hired you to be the captain. You're the guy that has to be accountable for my Titanic sinking. And so it was with Adam in the garden. When God came down into the garden, he didn't call for Eve or Adam and Eve. He called for Adam alone and wanted to know what happened. He asked, you know, Adam, where are you? He didn't ask that because he didn't know. He was asking this as a teaching moment, a rhetorical question to make a point to Adam that you're hiding because you're in sin, see? And I know it because I see everything. And so Adam gave an excuse that, you know, the woman you gave to me, she, you know, seduced me and beguiled me and I did eat. And God says to Eve, the woman, he says, what is this that thou hast done? Again, not because he didn't know the answer. He knew what she had done. He condemned the whole human race. He was asking her that so that she would have a teaching learning moment. And so that Adam would understand the full import of the disaster that he had instituted by listening to the voice of his wife rather than the voice of his God. And as a result of that, as I pick this up, as a result of that, God did what? He then pronounced judgment. He said to Adam, everything in the universe, including you, is going to die because of what you've done. To the woman, he said, I'm going to make you have a menstrual cycle. You're going to have pain every month. And when you are giving birth, it's gonna hurt a lot as opposed to being easy peasy, like you know, making a cup of coffee in the morning or something like that. I'm gonna make you suffer for a little bit as a reminder of the rebellion that you instituted here and for luring your husband into this. But then to Satan, who was in the form of the serpent, he says this, he says, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed. And we know from our studying of the Proto-Evangelion, the her seed is a contradiction in terms. Women don't have seed, the Hebrew word zera. That's the spermatozoa only men have, you know, uh, uh, who was it? It was uh, uh, Nimrod uh, spilled his seed upon the ground. Not Nimrod, but uh, uh, Na Nabob, or I forgot the guy's name. <laughs> Yeah, he spilled his right. He spilled his seed on the ground instead of getting his wife pregnant. And guy got mad. That is making reference to the reproductive uh, emissions of the male uh, of the species. Women don't have that. So what we interpret Genesis chapter three verse fifteen as saying is that God was predicting that the woman was going to give birth without the contribution of the DNA or the seed of the man to create this special messianic individual, this special virgin-born God-man, the seed of the woman, we now know came into being on the planet Earth some, oh goodness forbid, 2,500 years later, you know, Jesus came along, um, you know, give, give or take, 2,000 years later, after that, after that very first prophecy, Jesus comes to Earth, born of a virgin named Mary, and became the Messiah and died on the cross. So if we look at that clause, that passage in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and we accept that the seed of the woman turned out to be a literal God-man, God in human flesh, Jesus of Nazareth, who had flesh and bone and in his first incarnation had blood as well and was able to die on the cross for us, then we must also accept that the rest of that same passage that makes reference to thy seed, the thy seed in that passage is God speaking to Satan. He's not telling Eve this, he's telling Satan this. He's saying, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, whether that woman be Eve or daughter of Eve, which turned out to be Mary. I'm gonna put warfare between the two of you between thy seed, Satan, and her seed. Her seed was Jesus who crushed the head of the serpent and bruised his heel in the process of getting crucified. So what many theologians have done is they've ignored the thy seed comment that God makes directly to Satan. What God is saying is that to the extent that if God himself had a biogenetic offspring in a physical human form, then 
to be logically consistent in the interpretation of that same passage, you would have to find then that Satan would also have a biogenetic offspring in the form of a man because they're both referenced in the same sentence with the same uh, verbal uh, you know, distinctives. So Jesus became a man, even though he was God, he was manifest in human flesh. So Satan, even though he is a spirit celestial being, he will also have the ability somehow, some way, some fashion, to be able to manifest a descendant, a biogenetic offspring of his own in human flesh that eventually we find out will meet up uh, in battle against Jesus Christ at uh, Revelation chapter 19. And Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 4 already gives us the mechanism by which it could occur. Angels having actual sexual intercourse with women when they take on forms of human men. So we don't know exactly how the Antichrist comes about, but there's probably good support for the idea that Antichrist won't be just a man. That's why he's the son of perdition, meaning that he was damned even before he was brought in to existence. If that was the case, that the Antichrist was a real son of Adam, then the gospel of Jesus Christ, John chapter uh, uh, 3, verse 16, would be wrong, right? It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever of the world, meaning the sons of men, daughters of Eve, the children of men, any one of them could be born again if they chose to. But since the Antichrist is the son of perdition, meaning he's the son of destruction, meaning he's born of destruction, it would seem to suggest that even... From the time of his birth, he's already disqualified for eternal life. Just like we found the Nephilim tribe that was referred to as the Rephaim, which literally means the dead ones, because they are not eligible for born-again salvation and eternal life, which is the second birth. So, okay, so now we move on with the time we have. We've, we've, just amazing. When we talk about these things, we get through this so quickly. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, try to cover everything. In times past, I was looking at some of our earlier uh, teachings on the Antichrist from, oh my goodness, back I saw one from 2014 earlier today. It was like three hours long. I tried to put the whole thing in, and we we still couldn't get it in. We were going like, you know, three sessions of three hours a piece. I promise, I talk faster now, more succinct than I used to be. So I won't keep you guys for three hours tonight for sure. But with the time we have left, we're gonna run through just a general overview of the rest of the passages and then next week we'll unpack you know each one of these in in context and we'll try to tie it into certain modern day distinctives that show that we are really right at the end of the end so we've already jumped through john first john chapter 2 verse 18 those of you guys at home please take note of these passages and read these verses on your own so that the holy spirit can do the hard work of putting the word in your heart you can say aha that's what he was talking about. It's one thing when you listen to it, it's good to hear. Learning through the ear gate, followed up by reading, can really submit the concepts, and then it gives the Holy Spirit time to build these concepts into your heart. So we've already gone through 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, where we know that John is saying that this individual who is this evil guy that has been predicted in Scripture is referred to as the Antichrist. And that's the name that has stuck, even though he's referred to by 40 some odd different titles in scripture and many times he was referred to more frequently uh, than by the title the antichrist but that's a good one because it clearly points out the twofold nature of antichrist he comes he's really against jesus christ but he's going to be against jesus christ by pretending to be jesus christ during the 70th week of daniel but it has to be after the rapture of the church Okay, and he's going to have all powers and signs and lying wonders that he will get from his father, Satan. We inherit our distinctives from our father. Steve, you can golf well because your dad's a good golfer. You've inherited skill in, in, in certain athletic endeavors from your dad uh, because you are the biogenetic offspring of your father. You are your father's son, as it were. Okay, <laughs> so Genesis chapter 3, verse Verse 15, the Proto-Evangelion, not only does it give us the virgin-born God-man, Jesus Christ, but it also gives us the Satan-born, evil man, 
the Antichrist, who has to be a physical entity in a physical body during the last days. Genesis chapter 6, verses, uh, verse 4, we found out that fallen angels can have sexual relations with women and create hybridized superhuman Nephilim offspring, which are bigger, stronger, and more powerful than regular human beings, but look very similar to us. So angels can create biogenetic offspring. So therefore, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 would not be uh, precluding Satan from being able to have a biogenetic offspring. Then we jump down to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. We haven't looked at that yet, and with the time we have remaining, let's go ahead and take a look at that. We find out that that is the passage that makes reference to the legendary passage in time called, uh, in scripture, called uh, the 70 weeks prophecy. And quickly, I'll, I'll jump uh, in, into that one and lay that one out. That's a little longer, so I'm going to go ahead and read that for you guys. In essence, what we found out is that Daniel, when he realized that the 70 years captivity that had been predicted by Jeremiah the prophet was coming to a close as they were in captivity in the land of Babylon after the Babylonian captivity, what we found out then, and let's see on our little uh, you know, Bible prophecy chart, let's take a look here. Here is kind of a map of the Holy Land. Here is Jerusalem, and you would have ancient Babylonia is here. And so what Nebuchadnezzar did is came and destroyed the temple and took captive everybody of the Jews that they didn't kill. The young men and the women were taken away in captivity to the land of Babylon. And here is where the Babylonian Empire was headquartered. So from there to there. And so what we see is that after 70 years captivity, you know, uh, Daniel read Jeremiah chapter 25 and realized that it was only going to be 70 years captivity and they were going to be allowed to go back home to rebuild the temple and to reestablish uh, the, the Jewish state, Israel. And so when Daniel realized that, he started praying and thanking God. And while he was thanking God, God interrupted his prayer of thanksgiving by sending Gabriel, the, the messenger angel who pronounced parenthetically, the birth of Jesus Christ. He was the guy that announced that a virgin would conceive and give birth to the savior of the human race. And that's what we see in Luke chapter two and Charlie Brown Christmas and all of that. You know, behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day a savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's Gabriel. The same Gabriel did something similar several centuries earlier. He went to Daniel who was uh, in the final stages of the 70 year captivity in Babylon. And he said to them this, starting at verse 24, he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to anoint the most holy. So he's basically saying that, you know, 70 weeks is the period of time until the kingdom of heaven will be established on the earth and all righteousness will be on earth. But now he's not talking about 70 weeks of days, Steve. What's he talking about? 70 weeks of years. 70 weeks of years. And so we go to our 70 weeks of years prophecy chart. And I can do that a little bit better by giving you the jumbo side. Let's go to the jumbo video screen here. And here you have it. Boom, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And for those of you that are following along at home, I will again give you the close-up that you can kind of screenshot. This is our 70 weeks of Daniel timeline prophecy chart. And so this 70 weeks is 70 weeks of years, not 70 weeks of days. So that would be a total of 400 90 years. If you take 7 and multiply it times 70, you will get 490 years. But the 490 years, Steve, are not contiguous. Only the first 69 weeks of years are contiguous, meaning the first 483 years run together. And then something happens that causes the 70 weeks of years or the 490 prophetic years time clock to stop. And that something is the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel, the uh, seed of the woman, the virgin-born God-man, 
would get his heel bruised, crushing the head of the servant by doing what? By getting himself crucified, which he said was his death that, quote, he must accomplish at Jerusalem. So Jesus knew when he came to earth that he was supposed to die to pay for the sins of men and use his blood as a sacrifice to atone with God the Father for the sins of Adam and all of Adam's children. And so that was accomplished at exactly 173,880 days after the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus in Nisan 10, 445 BC. He was presented on Palm Sunday as the Passover lamb, not only for the nation of Israel, but for all of the human race because he had Gentile blood through Ruth. Remember that story of Ruth, the Moabites. He also had Gentile blood in his DNA. So he was able to die for the whole human race, but he had to be observed for four days. So on Nisan 10, which is the uh, terminus point for the 69 weeks of years prophecy. And then after four days uh, observation, he was crucified, which was him, the Proto-Evangelion, the Genesis chapter three, virgin born God man getting his heel bruised while he crushed the head of the serpent by redeeming the whole human race with his blood once for all time. John Calvin's wrong. All the Calvinists got it wrong. It's not just the uh, preordained elect. It's everybody that's a human being. But the Nephilim aren't included, so they don't get to be saved. Okay, so that stops our time clock. And the church age, we find out, 2,000 years now, has filled that time clock. That's the salvation by grace through faith alone. After that period of time, when the rapture occurs, then the 17th week will begin. And the 17th week... Low battery again. Can we... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for a second. Still okay, so yeah, so we're, we're gonna plug you into a power source. We got about another uh, few minutes left. Um, so at the 70th week of Daniel, after the rapture of the church, not only is Antichrist going to be revealed, but guess what else? What else happens is that you're not eligible for salvation based upon faith uh, through grace alone. You also have to do good works. And the good work you have to do is what? The good work you have to do is not take the mark of the beast. In other words, you have to be willing to have your head cut off to preserve your soul. Otherwise, you will die and go to hell. And so, again, the church era that we're living in now is the age of grace, and that age of grace is the only one where you can get into heaven only through the faith in Jesus Christ without any good works. And so, again... That is the distinction between the 69th and 70th week. So now, let me go ahead and read to you the remainder of the passage. It says, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild until, uh, in Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. That's the 69 weeks of years. And then it goes on to say in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And here is the key passage, verse 26, making reference to the Antichrist. It says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that passage gives us the idea or the concept that the Antichrist will arise from out of the Roman Empire. Why? Because the people that destroyed the sanctuary in 70 AD, Steve, were who? The Romans. Titus Vespasian, who was the general at the time, who later became the emperor of Rome, destroyed that second temple. That's the same temple that had got desecrated years before Jesus by Antiochus Epiphanes and that had been supernaturally cleansed during the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. That temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and now there is no temple uh, standing anymore in uh, the land of Israel or in the city of Jerusalem. And so it says that the people of the prince that shall come, so Antichrist is now being referred to here as the prince that shall come. Therefore, we know that he's going to rise out of the Roman Empire, but he may not be a Roman. There's a passage in Scripture, Micah chapter 5, I believe it is, we'll look at that next week, that talks about the Assyrian, when the Assyrian shall come into our land, that Joe Chambers and many other individuals believe is making reference to the Antichrist. Now, here's Assyria. 
Assyria is not to be confused with the land of Syria, which is just north of Israel. Assyria is farther to the west. It's as far west as Babylon, but north of it and just south of Armenia. So here is your Assyria on our Bible maps, and there is Jerusalem. So does the Antichrist come from out of Assyria? He somehow, it seems, we'll take a look at that next week, being referred to, if that passage is correct, when the Assyrians shall come into our land, is that referring to the Antichrist? Well, the Roman Empire was expansive. So it isn't necessarily exclusive of there being an Assyrian Antichrist who's also part of the revived Roman Empire. So what we find out then is that the Antichrist is going to be the guy who desecrates the temple. And so it says that uh, from the going forth of the command and restore and build until Messiah the Prince, meaning until Jesus shows up to be crucified, will be 483 years, or 173,880 days to the day. And that's exactly what happens. But then we pick it up in verse 26, and it says, after that 69 weeks of years, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, meaning he dies on the cross for the sins of the world. And the people of the prince that shall come, which is the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's making reference to the Roman Empire, which destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And then it says, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and until the end of the wars, desolations are determined. But more importantly, in verse 27, we find out that the Antichrist is going to come. And so we jump down and we find out in verse 27, the very next and final passage of that 70 weeks of Daniel passage in Daniel chapter 9, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He who? Well, it's going to be the phone. Um, well, that is making reference to none other than the Antichrist who destroys the temple. The Antichrist who destroys the temple will make a covenant for one week. And we already learned, Steve, that we're talking about a week of years, not a week of days. So we now get the idea that the Antichrist will broker a seven-year peace treaty that will be part and parcel of the sign of his coming. And it says that he shall confirm a covenant for one week, that is to say seven years. But it goes on to say, in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined be poured upon the desolate. Okay, so in essence, that's a fancy way of saying that Antichrist is going to come up, but after the first 69 weeks of years, when Jesus dies on the cross, that during this 2,000 year period of time, which is the gap period of time that we now know as the church era, the temple is gonna be destroyed, but then the temple will be rebuilt. But we know that that 70th week can't begin until after the rapture. Why, Steve? What passage that we already know about tells us that the rapture um, will come first and then the Antichrist in the 70th week comes? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that. It says that the departure has to come first. Doctrinally, which we already have, we already have a departure from Christian doctrine in nominal Christianity. The only next thing uh, we're waiting for is the physical departure of the church from the earth to the Father's house in heaven. Then the Antichrist can be revealed, the son of perdition. Then that 70th week of, of Daniel can begin when the Antichrist Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, confirms a covenant for seven years. A seven-year peace treaty, confirming covenant for one week, is the seven-year peace treaty that will trigger the running of the 70th week of Daniel. But we found out in verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9 that in the midst, meaning in the middle of, Steve, in the middle of that seven-year period of time, or in the middle of that week of years, the oblation and the sacrifice in the temple will be stopped. For the temple sacrifice to be stopped midway through the tribulation period, that means that something has to have happened first, Steve. And what would that be? Well, the temple would have been built. The temple that had been destroyed by the people of the prince that shall come back 
during the time of Jesus, shortly after the crucifixion in 70 AD, it will have to have been rebuilt during the beginning of that 70th week of Daniel, so that three and a half years into it, the temple sacrifices, which have already been running for three and a half years, would be stopped. And when it stopped, the Antichrist, we found out from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will go into the temple of God so that he, as God, enters into the temple of God, showing himself that he, the Antichrist, is God. That's the abomination of desolation, similar to the one that Antiochus Epiphanes did prior to Hanukkah, which is what Jesus celebrated when he was on earth. He would go to the Hanukkah celebration, and it was a type or a shadow of what Antichrist is going to do midway through the tribulation period. He will go into the temple and declare himself to be God, which is a new and greater abomination of desolation than even the one Antiochus Epiphanes did himself. Which brings us to Jesus' stunning revelation of Bible prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, that special Bible prophecy press conference uh, after the Olivet Discourse to the people. Jesus took his, his special closest uh, followers aside and he gave them a special private Bible prophecy press briefing. And Jesus said when he was asked, what will be the sign of your coming? And, you know, they said, what will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said, see that no one deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That's one of the signs that Jesus is about to come back. So, Steve, we've already talked about David Koresh. We already talked about um, uh, uh, Jim Jones. We talked about the guy in Durrell. We talked about all these different false individuals who claim to be Christ. And we also found out that Jesus said that many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. So Jesus is saying, just like Paul followed up several years later, Jesus is saying there's going to be an apostasy in the church. People in the pulpit claiming to be Christians who accurately acknowledge that I'm Christ will deceive many. Job's Witnesses do that, Seventh-day Adventists do that, Mormons do that, uh, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel preachers who say, Jesus is Christ, give me your money. They are also deceiving people with a false prosperity gospel that cannot save, even though they say Jesus is Christ. But separate and apart, and even more dangerous than that, will be the individuals who claim to be Christ, the final of which will be the Antichrist himself. So Jesus says, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then he goes on to say, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When you see this occur, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh will be saved. So what Jesus is clearly saying here, Steve, what he's saying is that the signs of the end of the world, the signs that the rapture is about to occur, Armageddon and the establishment of the kingdom of heaven is right at hand, is many false Christs coming saying that I'm Christ. And a false Messiah who claims to be Christ, but then he says the key thing is when you see the abomination of desolation, what abomination of desolation? Well, the one spoken of by Daniel the prophet. What is he talking about? He's talking about Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 is the 17th week of the 70 weeks prophecy. The 70 weeks prophecy is divided out into three segments. The first 69 weeks of years, a gap, and then the 17th week. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 makes reference to the seven-year period of time after the gap prior to the first 69 weeks running. And during that uh, final seven-year period of time, we found out that midway through the seven years, Daniel says that the uh, prince that shall come, who, who brokers a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel and the world, halfway through that seven years will go into the temple and desecrate it, causing the abomination of desolation. Paul 
gives us more detail of that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he clearly specifies that the Antichrist goes to commit the abomination when he as God enters into the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Jesus, who hadn't even converted Paul yet, was able to see through the corridors of time and saw this and, and warned, this is going to be the key sign that triggers what? A final 1260 day time frame, a final 42 months, a final three and a half years, if you will, until Jesus comes back at Armageddon and destroys the Antichrist. And so what, in essence, Jesus is saying, when you take all these things together, he's saying, look, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, meaning when you see the Antichrist, the guy who's the wonderful, beautiful, you know, beautific, beatific uh, world leader go into the temple of God that's rebuilt, and he sits down on the mercy seat and declares himself to be God, as glorious and awesome as that moment may be to the people of the world, you guys, particularly the Jews that have been left behind because they weren't born again believers because they weren't part of the church, you guys will know, because I'm giving you a special press briefing now, that's going to be the Antichrist. That's going to be the abomination of desolation. Then you should flee into the wilderness and don't go back to your home and get stuff because now Satan will fully inhabit the body of this Antichrist who is his biogenetic son and he will begin a killing of Jews and Gentiles, but specifically the Jews, unlike any time in history. In fact, we find out from the book of Revelation that it's going to be twice as bad as the original Holocaust. Adolf Hitler was a type of the Antichrist, but he only was able to kill one out of every three Jews on earth. There were about 18 million Jews on earth during the time of World War II. Hitler was able to get about one out of three, six million Jews into the ovens at Auschwitz, Treblinka, Birkenwald, uh, Buchenwald, and, and, and the various other uh, concentration death camps and kill off one out of every three. But the book of Revelation shockingly says Antichrist will double that number. In fact, double that percentage, two out of every three Jews. Now, you probably have what? Yeah, I don't know. You've got 100 million Jews on earth, meaning that if you doubled that, then that would be 70 million Jews that the Antichrist is going to kill. So he's really going to triple or even quadruple the death toll of what Adolf Hitler was able to accomplish. In fact, Jesus said, unless those days were shortened to 1260 days, three and a half years, or 42 months, nobody would be left alive, including no Jews. But for the elect, Israel's sake, God is going to limit Satan's killing fields, carnage and destruction of the people of the book, the Jewish people, to only 1260 days. So he can't get to all of them before Jesus gets to come back to rescue them. And so when he comes back, all Israel will be saved. All Israel alive at the second coming will have believed on Jesus as the Messiah just prior to his return. And so all Israel will be saved. And so with that, we will end it right there. We didn't get through the other prophetic passages. We'll look at those next week when we come back to get, do part two of the Antichrist. So with that then, Steve, thank you so much. Close out in a word of prayer, Steve-O, and we will pick it up. Now, Saturday, we're going to be on South Beach doing uh, uh, preaching and teaching, and uh, we may try to continue that depending upon how, how, how windy it is out. I'll be able to take my charts and boards out, so we'll pick this up either on Saturday or at the very least next Thursday when we come back. So depending on weather conditions on South Beach, We'll be able to continue part two of the Antichrist. If it's too windy to do it on Saturday, we will continue this when we meet at our midweek teaching on Thursday of next week. So Steve, close out the word of prayer. So Steve, say say goodbye to to all our friends and family out in YouTube land. There's okay. Stevie. See you next week at the father's house. All right, there's Stevie boy live from Dothan, Alabama. Gonna say hello to Liz and Jonathan and all our other guys out there. So with that, 
we will depart and we will see you guys either on Saturday while we're preaching. We will be preaching on Saturday and hopefully we'll be able to do this if it's not too windy out um, or next week. And as Steve says, not there, then up in the air. In Jesus' name, we'll see you guys. Take care.